Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, it's so funny that with the, my UAA visa, they saw the word investigator, and for people who understand Arabic, they said my job is muhaqqiq. So I could interrogate you all after my talk to see if you learn anything. So today I'm going to tell you about uh, how the retina and uh, in, the, in mammals detect light to affect our behavior. But before I start my talk, I would like to acknowledge the people who did the work. Uh, this is where I started at Johns Hopkins Biology Department. We were part of the mouse tri lab where my wife, uh, Hai Chen Zhao, and myself had the three lab that we called it uh, the mouse tri labs. And we shared the Asian students and ideas, so it was great so you don't get bugged into your little area of research. So that was great for young scientists. If you have somebody you could start your lab with as an assistant professor, I think that's always a great thing to do. And in 2017, I moved to the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, and you wonder why a retina person moves to mental health. Hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll tell you why. So I'm gonna acknowledge the people who did the work during my talk, and at the end, uh, I will take any questions, or you could interrupt me also if you have any questions during my talk. So the rotation of the Earth around its axis allowed the light environment to change drastically across the day-night cycle. So for example, in a very sunny day in Abu Dhabi, you possibly can get 10 to the 16th photons per centimeter square per second on your skin. And the same area at night, if you don't have artificial light, can have only a few hundred photons. So this really incredible change in the amount of photons that are in the environment posed a problem for vision. How can you see at this very bright light conditions and these very dim light conditions? But it serves something really important for all organisms on Earth, including plants, which, as you know, cyanobacteria is the reason we're here, where they use this information to develop an activity that is dependent on the light-dark cycle. So for example, cyanobacteria itself has a circadian clock that separates the nitrogen fixation from photosynthesis because they don't have membrane and the two reactions are toxic to each other so the, 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 they can be temporally separated. And this is really interesting in lieu of the talks that I heard yesterday because that's why the oxygen level in the environment changed and we actually were able to appear on this Earth. So in mammals, all light detection happens in the retina at the back of the eye. So uh, just, this is really exciting for me actually because it's the first time I'm gonna go really basic. So it, I'm sorry if you, if you find this very basic, but I'm gonna introduce the system. So in mammals, light detection happens in the retina. The optic nerve, which is formed from the retinal ganglion cells, which I'll tell you more about later, project to areas in the brain that allow you to do different behaviors, which we heard yesterday in the beautiful talk. And one of these areas is the LGN, or lateral geniculate nucleus, or the superior colliculus, which allow you to consciously see the images. So although you're looking at a two-dimensional image here, you consciously know there is a waterfalls, there is a cliffs, and there is even a blue sky. So this information is sent to your retina and then sent to the cortices, and they reconstruct the image in your cortex to allow you to build this three-dimensional structure. But the eye detects functions that are independent of image formation and are collectively known as non-image forming visual functions. These are the simple pupil constriction. This is your pupil in the dark, this is your pupil in the light. And the pupil just regulate the amount of light that goes into your retina. And although this is a very reflexive and simple behavior, it actually requires five different synapses from the retina to the pu pupil muscle to drive this behavior. And I'll tell you why this is important later in the talk. But what I'm gonna concentrate most about today is circadian photo entrainment, which we thought was the exclusive function of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the location of your circadian clock. Uh, but we now know from my work in my lab that the intergeniculate leaflet may be involved as well and maybe even the ventral lateral geniculate nucleus. Unfortunately, I won't have any time to talk about this, but I would love to discuss it uh, in person if you have any questions. So why is circadian photoentrainment important? You're all aware of your sleep-wake cycles, I hope, because it's so important for you. So we sleep on a daily rhythm. If you're in train, you sleep with a daily rhythm. If you're not in train, you could have a problem sleeping. 
But even as supposed isotherms, as supposed organisms that keep our body temperature constant, actually your body temperature fluctuates pretty remarkably across the day-night cycle with a degree of difference between the sleep time and the wake time. In addition, what really got me very excited about the field is even our cognitive ability change across the day-night cycle. So I always tell this to my students when I used to teach at Hopkins, that although every individual here is different, you as a single individual, you're not the same person at noon, early evening hour or night. You not only change molecularly and hormonally, but also behaviorally and cognitively. So how do we mimic this in the lab? It's actually quite easy. We put a mouse in a cage with a wheel. Every time the mice run on the wheel, we record the activity. And so this is a single mouse in a cage, and these are the days that we keep them in the cage. We give them different light-dark environments, and we double plot the data, so you could see the onset of two consecutive days on the same line. So mice are nocturnal animals. You could see that they confine their activities to the dark portion of the night. If they are entrained, they have an exact 24-hour period. So what you notice if you calculate the amount of running that happens in a single night here, so let me just put it in perspective. You see this small blip here. This is approximately 300 wheel running revolutions per 10 minutes. So if you calculate the amount of running they do in a single night, it comes up to be us running four to six miles every day on a treadmill. So that's why the, the wheel is a very enriching environment. So what you notice is that they entrain to the light dark cycle, but what's so remarkable is now these animals are put in constant conditions, in this case constant darkness, there is no light in the environment, and you give them food at all times of the day so they can't entrain by food, yet they have a beautiful circadian clock. I mean, honestly, this is a real experiment. This is a real behavioral experiment. When I first did this, I couldn't believe how precise their circadian clock is. It's not accurate. It's not 24 hours, but it's incredibly precise. And you could do this to, to the mice what this uh, conference has done to us. You could bring them, I mean, it's not as bad, it's not nine hours, it's only six hours, but you could bring them from New York to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to New York, and you see, just like us, it takes you actually one day to entrain to every hour shift. So by the time I'm leaving United Arab Emirates, which is the 1st of March, I would have been fully entrained here to go back and suffer the re-entrainment in the United States again. So what's so cool about the system, although it's a behavior, it's non-invasive, it's very informative, it tells you not only about the ability of the animal to detect light, but also about the circadian rhythms of the animal and the speed of entrainment of the animals to the light-dark cycle. So light environment was kind of ignored, why? because of the retina, I'll tell you why. The mammalian retina is a very interesting structure. So if you take your eye and you look through the pupil, the first layer you see are not the photoreceptors that allow you to see the images that I told you about, but the retinal ganglion cells. These retinal ganglion cells are part of the retina and they are on the surface of the retina. And their axons form the optic nerve that I told you connect the eye to the brain. Now light has to cross all these neurons even the initial segments of rods and cones, before it hits the photosensitive parts of rods and cones that contain the photopigment rhodopsin and conopsins. So what is rhodopsin and conopsin? Simply they are proteins that take the photon energy and through a phototransduction pathway, change that energy into an electric signal so the neurons in the retina can understand it. So they, send the, they change the photon energy into an electric signal, send it back through the retina, to the ganglion cells, which then send the information to the brain. So people assumed for photoentrainment, it has to be either rods, which allow you to see in dim light conditions, or cones, which allow you to see in color. And here's where the whole field went crazy. In 1999, two science papers from uh, Russell Foster's lab uh, have found that Animals that completely lack rods and cones, and hence are called rodless, coneless animal, are image blind, but are completely capable of entraining to the light-dark cycle. So this was shocking. Not only they were entraining to the light-dark cycle, they were entraining with the same sensitivity as the control animals. So they came up with the idea that there may be other photoreceptors in the retina that are non-rod, non-cone photoreceptors, and people laughed at them, honestly. They literally laughed 
and I'm not joking here, like people would go to their poster and say, this is crazy, you're missing something. And it was only in 2002 when pioneering work by Eggy Provencio, who cloned an opsin, melanopsin, similar to rhodopsin and conopsin, and then David Burson, who first recorded from IPRGCs, and then in collaboration with us when I was a postdoc at Hopkins, we discovered that a subset of ganglion cells are intrinsically photosensitive. That's a fancy way to say they are photoreceptors. And they are retinal ganglion cells. They are not photoreceptors. So we call these new photoreceptors IPRGCs, and this is what I'm be referring to throughout my talk. IPRGCs are the new photoreceptors in the retina. There is so many interesting things about these IPRGCs. One, they express an opsin that is more similar to Drosophila opsin than to mammalian opsin, and I'll be happy to answer questions about that later. And opposite to these photoreceptors, which have to cross many retinal neurons in the retina first to go to the brain, they are more like the Drosophila photoreceptors where they project directly to the brain. So they have a direct access from the retina to the brain. And this then allowed us to specifically trace these ganglion cells to the brain. So I'm, I'm not gonna tell you the details, but trust me, we were able to use genetic tricks to label these cells specifically, as you could see here in the retina, and label their cables, their axons, so we could literally trace them to the brain independent of other ganglion cells. And we were really stunned how beautiful the evolution of this system is. So here is a mouse brain ventral view. Here's where the eyes are located, the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, and these two nuclei here you see expanded here are the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN, the central location of the circadian clock. So you could see this beautiful projection from the retina to the SCN that is located, that controls our circadian rhythms. However, when we looked more carefully in 2006 at all the areas that they project to, we were actually stunned to find that circadian rhythm was only one of many areas that these cells project to. So in addition to the clock, we found that they project to sleep and alertness center, to mood regulating centers, and to the pupil center, as well as other areas that I'll be happy to discuss if anybody has any questions. Even more interesting, when we first worked on IPRGCs, they all belong to this population, and for the retinal aficionados, although this is an on-ganglion cells, they arborize in the off-sublamina of the retina. Just that's all I'm gonna say about here, but I'll be happy to answer more about that. And this is really because of the work of these three amazing women in the lab. Now we know that IPRGCs are very diverse, and they can be easily differentiated based on very specific characteristics, both morphologically and electrophysiologically. But importantly, if you now knock out rod and cone, like the rodless, coneless animals, and remove the melanopsin photopigment, now you get an animal that is completely incapable of photo entrainment, even though they have eyes. So here's a, what we call the triple knockout animal, where wild type animals photo entrains, animals that have rodless, coneless, rods and cones removed photo entrain, animals that have melanopsin removed only photo entrain, but animals that have rods and cones and melanopsin remove, now look what happens. These animals cannot photo-entrain to the light-dark cycle. And when I presented this data first in 2007 at the Cold Spring Harbor meeting, Chuck Seisler, who worked on humans, came running to me and he said, this is incredible because we know there are two types of humans. Some humans are blind and they have normal sleep-wake cycle, and there is a subset of blind humans that don't have good sleep-wake cycles. So he wondered whether these humans would also lack the connectivity either to the brain or the melanopsin cells as well. Because imagine if this is your sleep-wake cycle and you cannot entrain. So if your sleep onset falls at the right time of the social day in the middle of the night, then you can sleep well. But look what happens when your sleep starts free running then this is what happens to you, which is happening to me right now, where you sleep, my sleep onset is falling in the middle of the day, luckily not yet in my middle of my talk, where I'm presenting while I'm supposed to be sleeping. Okay, so that was really exciting. And if anybody has any questions, please interrupt me. But that was really exciting because this showed a very surprising thing. You have amazingly 
evolutionary standardized photoreceptors in the case of ROT to detect the single photons, and yet there are these ganglion cells photoreceptors that don't even have specialization to keep the opsin in a concentrated place. Why were they preserved evolutionary? I have some data to tell you about that, but I, again, I don't have the time to present, but I'll be happy to present to you. So now that we know there are three different types of photoreceptors in the retina, we wanted to ask a very simple question. What would happen if we only killed the M1 IPRGCs? By the way, in the mouse retina, there are 30 to 40,000 ganglion cells, of which only 700 are M1 type. So we did, again, genetic trickery, um, and we used the toxin that only kill IPRGCs that express high level of melanopsin and only kill them in adult animals. So these cells will only die two to four months after birth. And what was really remarkable is now you remove these 700 cells. These animals are completely image capable. So if you give them any visual test, they do it similar to the wild type animals. Yet, when you put them under light dark conditions, even though they are image capable, they completely free run. And we have never found yet a human where have normal image formation and free running, but I heard from friends of mine that there may be something finally coming out where there are a subset of human beings that are normal image capable, yet they cannot have a normal sleep-wake cycle because they think their cells are affected, which would be very interesting as a proof of principle. But this was really remarkable anyway, because this tells you that the IPRGCs and the visual system, the image forming system must have evolved independently, and that all non-image system requires these very simple photoreceptors to send the light information from the retina to the brain. So it was really interesting once you get deep into a system to find how the field really narrows itself. And I'm a circadian biologist, and I've always thought of it this way. I thought in humans, we have light hitting our eye, which entrains our SCN, and then the central pacemaker in the SCN send all the information to the peripheral clock. So if you look at your own body, there are clocks everywhere in your body, including your skin. Your skin have biological clocks. So first of all, the biological clock is not a function of neurons, and it's like an orchestra. The SCN orchestrates all these different times. So I don't know if you saw the choral talk yesterday, but even like the fish can make certain behavior to switch from day to night, depending on how it's orchestrated with the other part of the circadian system. And the idea that all the information go to the SCN and then the SCN send the information to other part of the, the, the body. And we have shown at least in mouse, and we think this is gonna be similar in human, that all this information comes through a single type of IPRGCs, the M1 IPRGCs. But then I started asking myself a question, why do we have all these different brain regions that are innervated with IPRGCs? So we wondered whether in addition to this beautiful evolutionary conserved in all organisms, photo entrainment pathway, there may be a direct pathway that is independent of the SCN that can influence many behaviors and the behaviors we chose are dependent on the areas that were innervated by IPRGCs. So we ask a very simple question, does light directly influence his behavior independent of the SCN pacemaker? And to answer this question, we had to come up with a different animal. And this animal was done with Alan Chen, who now has his own lab at Taiwan. And what he found is that only the SCN projecting IPRGCs do not express a transcription factor brain 3B. So I'm not gonna tell you about brain 3B, I'll be happy to discuss it. But if you do intersectional genetics and kill cells that express melanopsin, which is the IPRGCs, and brain 3B, you end up killing all the IPRGCs that don't project to the SCN. And in fact, the data was so remarkable, I still don't believe it, how beautiful it is. So here's an animal where we kill only brain 3B positive IPRGCs, and now we're labeling all ganglion cells. We're injecting a dye in the eye that labels all ganglion cells. And what you could see is the SCN is fully innervated. As I told you, the SCN is, is innervated by brain 3B negative IPRGCs. The image forming centers are still innervated because conventional ganglion cells will not gonna die. They don't express melanopsin. But look at all the regions that are non-SCN innervated from IPRGCs. They are intact in the wild type animals, 
completely denervated in the animals that lack five minutes? Okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna go through all my slides, but it's okay. At least I'll, I'll give you some hint of what, what we're doing. So what is really interesting about this animal, as I told you, is that only 200 M1 cells remain in these animals from IPRGCs. All the non-IPRGCs die. But remarkable, even 200 M1 cells are sufficient for photoentrainment. So if you look at photoentrainment in these animals, it's completely unaffected. So this gave us a very nice system to ask the question, in the presence of enormous circadian photoentrainment, what happens to the direct light effect on behavior? And since I'm running out of time, I'm just gonna tell you that I'm gonna tell you just about mood control and I'll be happy to discuss all these different uh, areas that we published already and I was gonna tell you an unpublished story but I won't be able to go through. <laughs> so how did we first uh, found the mood control? And I'll tell you this story in five minutes and I will stop. So one of the problem about previous work is that when you give an irregular light cycle to any organisms, you also mess up their sleep and circadian rhythms. So to be able to study the effect of light on mood independent of sleep and circadian rhythm, you have to come up with an ingenious way to do it. You have to present a light cycle that can be occurring at all different circadian phases, but somehow it should not cause sleep deprivation or circadian arrhythmicity. And I thought that was a crazy idea till these two amazing women in the lab, Kara and Tara, came up with a cycle that allowed us to do this, and this is called the T7 cycle where you give 3.5 hours of dark, 3.5 hours of light, and you repeat them for two weeks. And I'm not gonna show you the data, but in this animal, light is presented at all circadian phases, but it doesn't cause sleep deprivation or circadian arrhythmicity. However, when you look at mood-related behavior, and because of the lack of time, I'm just gonna tell you about the sucrose preference test. Sucrose preference test is the ability to test animals' drive for sugary stuff. All organisms like sugary stuff. So if you give the mice two bottles of water, one spiked with sucrose, they drink nearly 70% to 80% of the time from the sucrose spiked water as a indication of a lack of pleasure seeking behavior, which is usually observed as an endophenotype of um, people with depression. You could see lower level of drinking from the sucrose spiked water indicating that just putting animals in a different light cycle can cause, cause mood related problems. In addition, we also did some hippocampal depending learning and memory test, and we found that this is also affected. So this is what I call the iPhone system test for, for people who are not neuroscientists. So mice are inquisitive like us. If you give them two objects that are the same and then take them one hour out of the same cage and then give them a novel object, they spend 70% of the time with the novel object compared to the familiar object. This is why I call it the iPhone test, because people go crazy between iPhone 13 and 12, because 13 is the novel and 12 is the old. So what you notice, if, if they would remember seeing this object, they spend more time with the novel object. But if they have a memory problem, they spend the same time with the two objects. So again, just by putting them in a different environment, cause them lear learning and memory problem. So I won't show you the data, but I promise you that if you kill the M1 IPRGCs, the T7 effects are then completely abrogated. So now we showed beyond reasonable doubt that light itself can affect the mood of the organism. And actually, in a way, it's not surprising. We have known for many years that people who live in the Northern Hemisphere, in, in Denmark, Sweden, in the winter month, they have what is known as seasonal affective disorder. And we came up with a new model at the time in 2014, which was very controversial, not anymore. We said that we're not debating whether sleep and circadian rhythm disruption can cause sleep and uh, mood and learning and memory problem. But what we think there is a direct pathway through the M1 IPRGCs that affect mood independent of sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. And what is remarkable, at least in rodents, image forming pathways are not responsible. Now, whether this is the same in humans or not, it's something to be determined. And I'm gonna just end here and go to the acknowledgement. I hope you won't see how many slides I was hoping to go through. And so here we are. <laughs> so I've, I would just like to acknowledge the people who helped us do the work. I didn't talk about the unpublished stuff that we're doing on the medial prefrontal cortex with Yogita, but uh, the uh, Brain3B experiments were done with Tudor and Jeremy Nathan when I was at Hopkins. 
and all the funding agencies on the outside, specifically, specifically the Packard Foundation, which actually believed in our idea to test light independent of circadian and sleep problem, and now the generous support by the intramural funds at the National Institute of Mental Health. And I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you so much.